Well, it's been a great, great three days for me. I don't know if it's been for you guys, but for me it's been great. I've been able to uh, get to talk to a lot of you guys and eat a lot of meals with you guys. And um, I love wheat and food. Some of you guys, like two of you are excited about that. Yeah. I'm telling you, I don't know what's ranked this year, but I remember I went to a boarding school where the food was horrible. And I stayed really skinny. And then when I came to Wheaton, I gained 20 pounds in the first semester. <laughs> exactly. Most of which was muscle. <laughs> so. But I was thinking as I was, um, I sent out an email to a lot of my friends, a lot of them are alumni, and I just got this overwhelming response from the alumni, just telling me that they're rooting for me and that they want God to use me because they, their love for you is so deep. And I just wanted to encourage you that literally people from around the world who are doing missions work and ministry and uh, marketplace ministry, and, and, and so many of them are praying for you right now because there's something about us as alumni who've been so blessed here where after we graduate, our hope for you guys is actually that you guys would be more blessed by Jesus here, that you would be more in love with the gospel than we were, that you would be more radical for Christ, that God would send more of you out into the nations. And I just want you to know that there's a lot of alumni who right now we're just rooting for you guys and you'll never meet them until that final day. And so just know that you're being covered by really passionate, loving prayer, okay? Let's turn uh, for this last uh, sermon to uh, John chapter 15 and really this has been the theme. I actually uh, was preparing yesterday and only, uh, only at Wheaton do I do this because I, I really care for you guys so much. I actually prepared three sermons before I ended up on this sermon, all right? And in the first three, I just didn't feel like they were what God wanted me to speak. So I, I just kind of came back to the theme for this week. John chapter 15, and I want to just read verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain or abide in my love. Let's come before God again and just ask God for his blessing in this few minutes that we have left. Let's ask him to speak to our hearts and to convince us that we are beloved in Christ. Let's pray. God, for the last few days, uh, I felt just a small, tiny little glimpse of the love that you have for these students. God, that you are able to look beyond the exterior and look into our hearts. You see the brokenness, you see the struggles, you see the striving. And you long for them to rest, to remain, to abide in this gospel. God, you long for their understanding and experience of this gospel more than anybody in this world, God. And so we cry out to you, Father, that you would take this short time, begin to heal and to change and to convince hearts that they are beloved because of Christ. And all of God's people said, amen. The text for today, the word of God says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain or abide in my love. And the question I have is this, why doesn't Jesus just say, I love you, now remain in this love? Why does he add this previous sentence where he says, as the Father has loved me, so now I have loved you, remain in this love? I think it's because he understands what the disciples are about to go through. That they're going to go through this incredible failure. That Peter is going to deny him three times. And I think he understands that in that moment where Peter denies Jesus three times, Peter is not going to be convinced that Jesus loves him. Peter will either be ashamed or feel guilty or probably condemn himself. Just like so many of us do when we make mistakes. Or he would just try to earn it back. I won't deny you next time, Lord. I won't fall away this time. And every single person in this room, when we sin or we make mistakes or we do things to dishonor God, 
That's usually the response that all of our hearts have. Either we beat ourselves up, we condemn ourselves, we align ourselves with the evil one who would accuse us and condemn us. Or we say, you know what, I'm going to try harder. Make me like one of your hired men, Lord. Let me serve you a little bit more. Let me be in a little bit more of the ministries. and Let me lead a little bit more. Let me pray a little bit harder. Read a little bit more of the word. Fast a little bit more. And then maybe, just maybe, I will merit your love again. There's a third option, Wheaton. When you sin, and you feel unworthy, and you feel unacceptable, and you feel dirty and stained, there's one other option. It is to abide it is to remain, it is to rest in the love of Jesus Christ. As the Father has loved me. If I were to ask you, do you believe that God loved his son Jesus? I'm pretty sure almost everybody in this room would say, absolutely, of course. Jesus earned that love. And I think God wanted, Jesus wanted the disciples to literally have that as the foundation. In case you ever doubt, does Jesus love you? Go back to the first sentence. That's the foundation. Just as the Father has loved Jesus, you believe that. So in the exact same manner, Jesus has loved you, even when you feel like you don't deserve it. So how has the Father loved his son Jesus? I think about that passage where Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan River and he comes out of the Jordan and God opens up the heavens and speaks that word, this is my son whom I love, and with him I am so pleased. I remember when I was, uh, uh, just a few years back, I was visiting my brother in New York because he had his first daughter. His daughter's name was Kayla Grace. I talked about her a couple years ago when I spoke here for MIF. And I remember I was visiting him in his apartment. She was one month old. And I asked my brother Sam, can I hold Kayla Grace? I put her in my arms, this beautiful girl. My brother's six foot two. He's a senior managing director of one of the largest firms in the world. He's a tough, competitive guy. And as I was holding little Kayla Grace, this six foot two guy screams out like a little kid, Dave, is she not the cutest baby ever? <laughs> My brother is bigger than I am, so I thought it would be wise to agree. <laughs> About 15 seconds later, my brother says again, no, 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 seriously, Dave, is she not the cutest baby ever? <laughs> now, the first time he told me, I could have thought, well, perhaps he's trying to inform me of something that I wasn't fully aware of. You know, I hadn't studied every single little baby in the world, so I wasn't sure if she was literally the cutest. But he had studied them, and he knew she is the cutest. <laughs> but the second time he told me, I wondered, why is he telling me again? And I realized it's because he was doing what C.S. Lewis said, where joy is not complete until it's expressed. Anybody could have walked through that door. He was so delighted in his little daughter that if you had walked through that door, he would have burst out and said, I don't know who you are, but is she not the cutest baby ever? because he was so joyful over this daughter. I was reflecting on this and thinking about what exactly did little Kayla Grace do to merit such delight? I mean, what has a one-month-old baby done to earn such approval? Let me tell you what a one-month-old baby has accomplished in the first 30 days. <laughs> that little baby has slept. That little baby has cried and woken up its parents. That little baby has eaten. And that little baby has gotten rid of that food that he or she has eaten in its diapers. Four things, slept, cried, eaten, and pooped. That's it. Now which of those things do you merit, do you, do you delight in your roommate for at Wheaton? <laughs> when your roommate wakes up in the morning, do you say, you were the cutest roommate ever. <laughs> you slept. When she goes to the bathroom, and comes out of the bathroom, do you say, you're such an amazing roommate, I delight in you because you actually flushed. <laughs> no, nobody delights in their friends for these four things. In other words, my brother was delighting and loving his daughter unconditionally. 
That's how a father, a sinful father, loves his daughter. Now rewind back 2,000 years to the baptism of Jesus. He hadn't even begun his public ministry. He had done nothing great. And this is what I imagine, okay? Theologians, relax. This is, I know this is an anthropomorphism, okay? <laughs> this is just my imagination based on the text, okay? Don't quote this out of context. But this is how I imagine it happening. Because I know God loves his son far more than my brother loved Kayla. And I imagine God up in heaven and Jesus gets baptized and he knows that Jesus is about to suffer in ways that he's never known and he's going to die on that cross for the sins of the world. And all those people who see Jesus getting back, they don't realize who he is, but God does and he loves his son so much. So he tears open the heavens and he shouts out loud, hey everybody, this is my son whom I love and with him I'm so pleased. And everyone in the crowd you remember was astonished and were wondering, what the heck was that? And God realizes what he did and goes, oops. And he shuts the heavens. Never to be heard until the transfiguration because he can't hold it in again. Now, I, again, I'm not saying, I know I'm at Wheaton. People are going to be like, hey, it's so not untheological. But I'm trying to get you to understand on an emotional level because the gospel, sometimes we keep it on such a rational, intellectual level. But your hearts have not been touched. You can relate to little Kayla. You can relate to a story of a father who takes delight in a child who's done nothing to merit it. Then why is it so hard for you to believe that Jesus, who died on the cross for all of your sins, could love you when you mess up? Why are you so afraid? Why are you trying so desperately to earn it? Why are you so insecure when Jesus' love for you is more lavish than any human love will ever be? As the Father has loved Jesus, you believe that, don't you? So in the same way, he loves and delights in you. And it's all because of Jesus alone. One of the texts I was kind of going through to maybe preach this morning was from 2 Samuel, I think chapter 9, where David and Mephibosheth, you remember this story? And one of the things that David asked is, is there anyone in Saul's household that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Because David made a covenant with Jonathan that he would show kindness to anyone in his household. And this phrase is repeated in this passage. Kindness for Jonathan's sake. Mephibosheth was crippled as a young kid. He was the only one left in Saul's household. At the end of this story, David is eating at the most powerful table in the nation with the most powerful people, the people who had merited that status. There was only one who was there because of another. That was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth had this gift that didn't feel like a gift to him. He was crippled. And because he was crippled, every time he was carried to that table, he knew as everyone stared at him that he was there for one reason and one reason alone. He received the kindness, the favor, the blessings, the resources of King David because of Jonathan's sake. In Wheaton College, you do not get love from God for any reason apart from Jesus' sake. He's not impressed with you because you lead all these ministries. He's not. He doesn't love you more because you fasted for 41 days. He doesn't approve of you more because uh, you, you pray and, and you, you get all your people together on your floor and you encourage them and you write them Bible verses and you tweet about Jesus. There is nothing apart from Jesus alone that will produce for us the lavish favor and love of the Father. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. God loves you because of Jesus alone. 
How has he loved us? He loved us enough to send his only son, Jesus, to die for us. You know, I remember I was a sophomore at Wheaton, and uh, we were in the cafeteria, and my buddy uh, asked me, he said, hey, Dave, are you going to give blood? Because there's this uh, blood drive today. And I was like, no. And uh, he said, come on, bro. And he gave, me, he gave me a lot of law. You know, he's very legalistic. And I was trying to hold to the gospel, but I failed, and I went and gave blood. <laughs> and I remember, you know, if you guys have given blood, you, you remember they give this huge needle. I mean, it's pretty big. And, and this huge bag, and it just fills up with massive amounts of blood. And you're concerned if they took a little too much. And, and the reward is amazing. They give you crackers and cookies. And I remember I felt really good about myself. And then about three days later, I got a letter in SIPO. And it was from the blood bank. And they said, Dave, we appreciate the fact that you gave this blood, but we have some uh, bad news for you. Uh, they found a virus in this blood, and um, you need to go to the hospital as soon as possible. So my parents got really worried, and uh, my dad picked me up and drove me to Good Samaritan Hospital in Downers Grove. And, and the doctor said these words to me. He said, Dave... Um, this virus could lead to cancer and eventually to death. I was 19 years old. Drove home to Naperville where my parents lived. My mom cooked me dinner and my mom and dad were there. My dad had told me on the way there that he had uh, gotten up at 2.30 in the morning to pray for me. And my mom had gotten up at 3 a.m. and she prayed for me all through the morning. And so at dinner I told my mom and dad, thank you so much for praying for me. And my mom looked at me in her broken English. She said these words. She said, Dave, how much should a parent sacrifice for the good of their child? But how much more as a Christian parent, when I find out that my child is sick, should I pray for him early in the morning? And this is what I prayed for you. Father, take away the sickness from my son and put it on me. You have to understand, my mom meant every single word. She was pleading with her father in heaven because she loved me so much. Lord, let me suffer, not him. Let me get the cancer, not him. Let me die so that he could have a healthy life. And when she told me that, I was blown away by this love. Just absolutely astonished that my mom would plead with God for that. Later, I was in my room in Trebra, I was sitting in front of my desk, and I felt a strong impression from the Lord. Why are you so amazed at your mother's love when I did something so much greater? I saw the sickness of the whole world called sin. And that the consequences of sin was death and eternity in hell. But I love my people too much and I wanted to be with them. So I was sent into this world to die on a cross so the sickness of the whole world called sin would be placed upon my soul so that anyone who would believe in me would be transformed and healed from the sickness called sin, forgiven of all their sins, credited with my righteousness, and given the promise of eternal life. That's how Jesus has loved us. As the Father has loved him, so for you, Wheaton College, Jesus was sent into this world to suffer the worst punishment that anyone will ever understand or experience because of his love for you. And the great challenge of discipleship in the Christian life is very simple. Now, remain, abide, in his love. You have a choice, Wheaton. By the grace of God, now you have a choice. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're now a slave to righteousness, even though Satan will make you feel like you're a slave to sin. But Romans is very clear. You have died to sin. You're alive to Christ. But you have a choice because Satan is clever and your sinful flesh seems so powerful. You have a choice in those moments to either rest at Wheaton College in your achievements or to rest in Christ's achievements. You have a choice every single moment and every single day to rest in your ability to earn his favor or to rest in Christ's perfect work where he earned your approval forever. You have a choice to rest either in yourself or in Jesus. And every day we make that choice. And every time by the grace of God we choose to rest in the gospel and the love of Jesus, the miracle of grace is that as Jesus is the vine and God is the gardener and you're just a branch, the health of that vine begins to flow into this sinful branch and begins to abound in the fruit of Christ. 
And as that fruit begins to abound, God the gardener begins to prune you and to discipline you so that you would abound more and more so that God would be glorified and you would be satisfied. You have a choice by the grace of God. And I plead with you, Wheaton College. I plead with you because of the love of God for you. As the Father has loved Jesus, so has he loved you. Now, remain, abide, and rest in the love of Jesus. Amen.